Greetings in the first mini lecture on the Ionians. Uh, I really stressed a couple of things. One, that the Ionians were interested uh, in rationality explaining the universe and their world rather than mythological or supernatural uh, functions. I don't know why my hair is all messed up this morning, but I did just get out of the shower. Um, they were interested in explaining things in material terms, and they debated this significantly. Uh, is the world primarily made uh, of water? Is that the ultimate stuff? Uh, is air the ultimate stuff? Is fire that ultimate stuff, uh, et, et cetera? But, but the emphasis on the Ionians should be moving the discussion from the spiritual, the supernatural, uh, to the rational and material, and by material, uh, actual things uh, that you can uh, observe, uh, see in some cases, uh, see the impact of. And your textbook takes this notion of rationality and materialism and discusses this debate about whether the world is orderly and systematic, or, or whether it is a random and perpetually changing universe that really does not have any long-term meaning because it's always in a state of flux. And when I look at what your textbook points out in terms of the theory of becoming in the theory uh, of being, and these Ionians debating uh, about whether or not uh, science better explains our universe or whether mathematical formulas better explain our universe. In, in reality, we know the two go together. Uh, we know about the interrelationship uh, of, of mathematics uh, and sciences and how mathematics, in many cases, is an important part of it. But in the Ionian world, uh, uh, they, they kind of pulled them apart. Uh, notice that the impacts of the Ionians are certainly later going to be on the political philosophers we're going to discuss, but also on the scientific world and on the mathematical world. And, and certainly some of the ideas that we get from these very, very early thinkers well over 2,500 years ago, in some cases, and some a little less than 2,500 years ago, uh, are, are with us today. So uh, certainly the notion of Democritus, that all things in the universe are made of atoms that move and combine in random uh, ways. And certainly uh, we, we talk about atoms and bonding. And certainly uh, many of you in here uh, have a lot more uh, experiences uh, in the sciences uh, than me. Uh, versus someone like Pythagoras, right? Another one of the uh, uh, the, the thinkers uh, that in this particular case, for those of you who uh, have studied perhaps the Pythagorean uh, theorem, for example, uh, and the mathematicians like Pythagoras believed that there was a pre-existing, a permanent design uh, and in this particular case, look to mathematical formulas that uh, certainly will represent a, a deeper reality than the reality gained through our physical senses. And certainly you see this later when we get to Plato, and I didn't write this in the notes, but, but certainly Plato was influenced by that. And when we get to the allegory of the caves, you'll notice that uh, this concept is borrowed when he talks about how most people uh, can be fooled by their senses uh, and that most people only get a superficial understanding of reality uh, and that there is a deeper reality than our senses and that in most cases that deeper reality can only be uh, observed, can only uh, only a few enlightened people, the guardian class, as he called them, or uh, my political philosopher always referred to Plato's philosopher, king or queen, and uh, most uh, uh, political theorists don't emphasize this, but 
Plato was an interesting character, believing that both men and women were equally capable of leadership and courage uh, and a variety of things. So even though we think of the ancient world as being very, very sexist in many ways, Plato opens up in his idealized political community uh, the notion that women uh, are equally capable of leadership uh, with men. Uh, I did write down uh, something that isn't in your book, uh, but I added uh, to it uh, in your notes. Uh, Plato was also influenced with this notion that the human soul uh, is immortal. Uh, I, I then uh, at the end of your notes, I just wanted to give you uh, some examples uh, of some of these really great thinkers. Uh, the, the amount that we know or the amount of knowledge that we know about some of these uh, thinkers is, is somewhat limited. Uh, in some cases, their writings are fragmented and we have pieces and bits uh, of knowledge from them. Uh, so they may actually have far more contributions uh, than we know. But I do want to reinforce what's in your notes, that these pre-Socratic thinkers are, are all philosophers of nature. So I'll emphasize probably there will be a question on the exam that will ask the Ionians were most interested in, I don't know, the physical world, uh, mankind, uh, man's relations to animals, I don't know, I'll make up some, but it's obviously uh, the physical world. Uh, they also embrace rational thinking. They want to understand what are the forces that make up our world. And of course, most importantly, uh, they all, whether uh, they embrace a particular substance or not, all of them seek a material answer, and whether it's through water or air or fire. I talked about that earlier. So so I listed a few. Uh, your book really doesn't uh, talk much uh, about them at all. Your book really just emphasizes this debate uh, between the theory of becoming and the theory of being, and you should have an idea uh, in basic terms of what that means. I'm not going to ask anything precise. But let's take a look at some of these people. And, and, and even though their guesses, uh, their hypotheses, uh, were wrong, uh, notice that they are moving away from we're at the whims of the gods to uh, our, our world having uh, some underlying dynamics, fundamental dynamics uh, that are influencing it. So Thales, uh, Thales uh, was uh, an engineer uh, with an impressive knowledge of geometry. Uh, he impressed many by diverting a river. He became actually famous right before a famous battle uh, of uh, informing both armies that there was going to be a solar eclipse, that the sun was going to go black for a short period of time. Uh, it occurred. Both armies ran from the battlefield from fear, as I have uh, pointed out in the notes. Uh, and in fact, uh, he is often considered, at least in the Western world, really the first to use reason, right? So so if I were to ask you, who is often uh, considered to be the philosopher, and I'm going to use the term philosopher, a natural philosopher, not a political philosopher, to use reason, the answer would be Thales. Now, that does not mean that Thales was always correct. Yes, he was correct with the eclipse. Yes, it was intriguing. Uh, what he did uh, in terms of diverting a river. But but certainly, uh, he was fundamentally wrong about several things. And I pointed a couple out, right? That uh, he believed that the universe was made of water. So everything's alive that has water in it. Okay, well, certainly our planet is about three quarters water or whatever it happens to be. Uh, the vast majority of our planet is water. So certainly that makes a certain amount of sense, and especially someone on the southern end of an island uh, looking out uh, at the expanse uh, of the Mediterranean, that makes sense. Um, but he believed that the Earth uh, floated on a great expanse of water, and his explanation for earthquakes was that because the Earth floats on water, 
from time to time, the earth gets rocked by waves and that rocking creates earthquakes. Well, we know that that isn't what causes earthquakes at all. But to me, it's not important that Thales was incorrect. But to me, what's intriguing is, as I put it, he's not spinning a myth. He is making a struggling attempt. Remember in chapter one, we called this a hypothesis. He is making a hypothesis in this case about what causes earthquakes. And he was wrong. But, but certainly his notion that the universe is material, uh, certainly that is correct, although certainly he was incorrect in pointing out that the ultimate material was water. Uh, I listed uh, a couple of others, and, a mix, uh, and I'm very bad on pronouncing these Greek names, but An Anaximenes, I think, right? He disagreed with Thales. He says, yeah, the world's material, but it's made of air, it's made of vapor, the world does not float on ocean, the world floats on air. Uh, he actually coined the terms uh, condensation and rarefication to describe how stuff condenses or thins out to form what we see around us. So once again, uh, concepts that we use today like condensation, uh, we get from the ancient world. Again, uh, Air really probably isn't the ultimate material, although certainly uh, air explains how and why you and, and I can survive. But to me, the interesting thing about these ancient Greeks aren't that they understand what the ultimate stuff is. Uh, it, it is the fact that they are seeing natural elements in nature uh, and they're trying to explain the dynamics uh, in a far uh, deeper way than had ever been there before. Uh, Heraclitus is the last one that I mentioned uh, in, in your notes. Uh, he says the underlying element of the cosmos is fire, not air, not water. Uh, he believes that the world is always changing and stability uh, is an illusion. And my political theory professor, I stole this uh, from him. He, he cited this and I've always remembered it. Uh, for the saying that no man can cross the same river twice, and I misspelled twice uh, in your notes, so uh, I probably need to go back in and correct it, because neither the man nor the river are the same. So you, you cross uh, a, a river today, uh, and then you go back to that river, and in that day you have changed a bit, uh, and so has the river. And so it's, a, it's, it's, it's an interesting saying, it's probably true, uh, he uh, uh, is famous for discovering the causes of both solar and lunar eclipses. And uh, for our course, uh, what he is most famous for uh, is that he is often credited uh, for bringing the notion of philosophy to ancient Athens. Uh, and what the Athenians are going to do uh, is they're going to change the focus of philosophy. So the pre-Socratic thinkers, those people in the Ionian world, the pre-Socratic thinkers, they are interested uh, in the natural world. Uh, they are interested in the world uh, around them. Uh, when we get to the ancient Greeks, uh, in this case, the Athenians, people like Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, uh, they're interested in you and I. They're interested in human uh, in political uh, behavior. Uh, they are certainly still interested in the physical world, but the center of their attention uh, is going to be on human behavior and political behavior. And to set up uh, Socrates and the sophists, who are the people that Socrates and Plato are responding to, uh, they see them as their antagonists, and maybe not their enemies, but we'll call them their adversaries. Uh, I'm going to give you a brief mini lecture on the Greek city-state system because the Greek world was a very, very different world than the modern nation-state state system that we have lived under since the 1600s, and we will deal with that in the next mini lecture.